Hello there, and welcome to the very first official episode of the Virtual CISO podcast. Uh, I'm your host, John Berry, and with me, as always, uh, the donkey to my Shrek, Jeremy Sporn. Hey, Jeremy. Uh, hello, everyone. How are you doing today, Shrek? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, pretty amazing. I mean, we, you and I have been chatting about a podcast for, gosh, the better part of uh, a year and a half or two years. Yeah, it's got to be that long. At least, oh, it's got to be at least two years now that I really think about it. It's, it was a, just a spark in your eye at one point, and here we are. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's kind of exciting. So uh, I'm looking forward to this, and, and I'm personally pretty excited about this first podcast. Uh, did you have a chance to listen to my conversation with Katie? I did. Um, it is just absolutely staggering what a threat exfiltration of data is to our national security. Um, you know, someone who is a little less technical in the information security space. Um, you know, I, I just had no idea. I mean, the number is staggering, $600 billion a year lost in exfiltration of data. Um, I mean, this has to put CMMC, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification, that's the mouthful, uh, as one of the most important initiatives the DOD is currently pushing. Yeah, well, you know, if you go back, and, and I had heard this through the grapevine, it was very interesting because, you know, it, it's, you know, Katie acknowledged the exact same issue. You know, the F-35 jet, you know, I think I've talked with you about that before. You know, I, I had to figure out what the number was, a trillion dollars in 15 years. And two years later, they're flying something down to the uh, screw diameter and color of the wingtips that's virtually identical. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so sad that that's a story that we have to live. You know, fortunately, we have people like Katie in this world who are trying to make a difference, which is which is really cool. Um and, and you know, if you're someone who listens to a lot of podcasts and especially has a, um, you know, I, I call them like podcast heroes, people that you like really enjoy listening to because you appreciate their intelligence and how they carry themselves. Katie falls into that world for me. And there's this commonality I find between all of them is that they have this sense of gratitude in, in their life. Um, and she is so gracious towards the people in the industry that she calls, you know, the, the people who are in the DOD supply chain who are supporting her and supporting the initiative. She just thinks that, um, you know, if you're one of those people, pat yourself on the back. You've done a great job supporting a phenomenal initiative uh, to date. Yeah, I think grateful is a great word for her. Um, she was also, I think, equally grateful to the support that she's had from, you know, the rest of the folks there at the DOD, you know, on her team upstream and downstream. So, yeah, I, I would say, uh, you know, grateful and gracious is a, is a good word for her because, I mean, they've done a, a really good job over there. Agreed. One hundred percent. So if you've made it this far, uh, do not stop now because the conversation between Katie and John is, is quite remarkable. Um, to give you guys a bit of an intro into Katie, uh, she is the Chief Information Security Officer for Acquisition and Sustainment at the Department of Defense. Do you think they pay her by the length of her title? Because um, if they do, if they do, that's <laughs> <laughs> it's well done. <laughs> smart move on her part, yeah. <laughs> uh, and she is the one leading the way at the DOD um, for creating the CMMC. Uh, amongst other things. Um, uh, she'll explain this a little further, which I think is really cool, but her background is absolutely perfect for her role there. Um, and she's one of those people that really make you proud of your government. You know, when you hear her talk, you think, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm happy my tax dollars are going towards someone so competent and so um, aggressive in uh, going after a really important goal. Uh, so it just, it, it, I couldn't say enough about how, uh, how happy, proud I am. Happy might be a little bit strong. <laughs> How about we go less unhappy about the tax dollars? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm more glass half full kind of guy, John. So I'm just going to go. All right. All right. Yeah. So you're you're in the gracious bucket with her. All right. Yes. Anything uh, else you want to cover before we uh, roll to the show? I would. Uh, just some expectations uh, for you to walk away with. There's the uh, big questions that you always want answered. The why, what, when, who, how. And they're in that order because that's how we answer them throughout the show. Uh, why the DOD is pushing so hard on the CMMC rollout, what the CMMC will look like for organizations in the DOD supply chain, uh, or, and this is a bit of a spoiler, but stick with me, any organization that holds a federal contract in general, so definitely want to hear that part, uh, when you can expect to see CMMC referenced in RFIs and RFPs, uh, who you can turn to for help, uh, and then the last one is how to leverage the CMMC to benefit you, the DOD, and really the whole nation. Some cool win-win-win uh, scenarios there. Sounds great. So with uh, no further ado, let's get to the show. Uh, Katie, 
Uh, thanks for joining yeah. us today. And and just for the record, for everyone listening, I screwed up and Katie was nice enough to re-record the first 15 minutes of this. So, so I'm so sorry. No, please don't worry <laughs> about it. I am honored and pleased to be here. It is my privilege. And um, I didn't say it on the first run, but I'll say it on this one. Um, I work for the U.S. taxpayer. I assume that you're one of those, so I'm kind of your employee, and I'm kind of okay with, with having to re retape it. So we're good. All right. So so uh, so so tell you know I like to start super simple. Uh, tell me a little bit about who you are and and what is it that you do. So I'm Katie Arrington. I am the Chief Information Security Officer for uh, Acquisition and Sustainment here at the lovely Department of Defense. Um, I am a Definitely different breed of uh, government um, uh, employee. Right now, they I'm an HQE, a highly, highly qualified expert. I am uh, only uh, given a certain amount of time to work in the Department of Defense in this capacity. And the reason I was chosen to come and do this is because of my uh, my past career. I've I've owned my own small business. Um, I worked in the defense industrial base at a large business, um, a service-disabled veteran-owned small business. Um, I worked at a non-traditional. Um, then I became a legislator to write, um, you know, one of my big passions um, was cyber policy and understanding how all that worked together. So I firmly believe that the road of my career led me to this moment where um, timing is everything. Um, I do not believe in coincidences. Um, I really believe that the time is now. The need is so urgent that it was just an opportunity that was laid out for me over a career to get to this point. All right. So before I dig in, right, into into why you're here to talk about CMMC, I mm -hmm. have to ask one simple question. Are, are you absolutely exhausted? Because I've seen your face, oh and your photo more in the last six months than I've seen Kim Kardashian's. And you know, I'm like I, I will say again, kudo. That is huge, right? She is everywhere. <laughs> she is a social media mogul. Um, but I, think you I are am. As well at this point. <laughs> I'm. I am really um, right now. It's you know, it's uh, after it's. 4.30 on a, a Friday that this podcast is being recorded on a, a long weekend here and the Pentagon is like a ghost town. And just being able to talk to you has re-energized me. Every time I'm able to communicate to people about why this is important and why I'm so passionate, I get energized. Um, it is my, you know, everybody has a superpower. Um, mine is the ability to convey excitement and why we should want to work together as a collaborative body to solve big problems. So, no, I'm, I'm tired, but I'm energized. Okay, so you mentioned big problem, and you definitely have been assigned the task of solving a big problem. So I want to ask problem. you a question. Yeah, yeah, right. So I want to ask you this question. So was there, uh, you know, so in the old days, as of last week, or actually January 30th, right, we had NIST mm -hmm. SP-8171, and that was a way that you would uh, self-attest to implementing an appropriate level of controls to secure CUI. Um, we're now moving from that to the CMMC, which requires third-party certification or a third-party audit of, of these controls. Um, was there a particular you know, straw that broke the proverbial camel's back that created this, uh, this effect, this change? Sure. So the NIST is actually referenced in something called the DFAR, the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation, 252.204.7012. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how the NIST 171 was put into defense contracts. Mm -hmm. um, and the self-attestation, when President Obama actually signed this in an executive order and it became the, the DFAR clause I just mentioned, um, we just said that a, a company had to self-attest. Mm -hmm. and Self-attestation is never a great idea when it's an, thing, a, an issue that we have to assume risk with each other. And, and I say this, and I, I you know, half-heartedly, because um, I always like to poke fun at myself, but every morning when I get up, I think I look perfect. It's only when I walk outside and someone else sees me that I realize I, I only have half of my face put on. I'm missing an <laughs> eyebrow. Self-attestation you, it's really hard to be critical about oneself because it, it, we're doing the absolute best we know how to do. I don't think anybody ever has woken up in the history of all time and said, today I want to be unsuccessful and I want to fail. We all go out with the greatest of intent, and I really believe that industry tried. Um, and the NIST, 
the, the National Institute of Science and Technology, they really worked hard on creating this, this model of you know, what we needed to do. The problem was it got lost in translation, right? Mm -hmm. It was, yeah, I, I see I've got to do that, and I have a plan of action to get better at doing that, and I have a plan to implement that control, and I'll do it within three years. The problem is our adversary isn't sitting at the local coffee shop saying, all right, I'll wait until you're ready. They have used that and exploited it against us. And how do we know that? There is a plane flying around very similar to the F-35 in China. Mm. That is not a joke, folks. That is literally they stole that from you. They stole it from a U.S. taxpayer. That's what they did. And we're losing 600 billion dollars a year in data Insane. exfil, Insane. cyber espionage. There's no way to say that they're, I mean, look at it, what they're doing. So we needed, we saw clearly in the department um, the need, the urgency. Congress saw the need and the urgency. And it's not like we don't know that commonly out there, you know, the financial sector sees it, the healthcare sector. It's just got to become commonplace. So there was an urgent need, um, why it was so uh, important and time sensitive to get this done. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I I think it's ridiculously important. You know, like I, I'm a I'm a big fan of, of of what you guys have accomplished, and I'm amazed that you've accomplished it in such a short time frame. You know, I love the idea that um, you're you're really going from a trust to a trust, but verify, right? Amen. Yes, yes. That's actually Miss Lord, the Undersecretary of Acquisition for. Uh, uh, sustainment as well. That was actually her statement in 2018. She actually came out and said that we needed to have a unified cybersecurity standard, that we needed to trust but verify, that companies were, were doing what we needed them to do to protect controlled unclassified information. Um, we clearly saw this. Um, there were several reports out at the same time. Um, if any of your listeners haven't read Delivered on Compromise by MITRE, they should read it. Um, the Navy Cyber Readiness Review came out at about the same time. And we also had something called the DOD, the Department of Defense, IG, Inspector General Report on Contractor Networks. And what everybody was saying in those reports and what Ms. Lord saw and uh, my boss, Mr. Fahey, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Acquisition, um, all saw clearly that there were fundamental basics about critical thinking around cybersecurity that we weren't doing. Um, as a, as a, a, you, a community of interest, we were not updating our passwords. We were not doing two-factor authentication, and we weren't marking the data appropriately. So there was a confluence of, A, we could clearly see how our adversaries exfilled our data. Um, they were flying it around. They are flying it around. Um, we, we saw that, that loss, um, and I believe um, there are no coincidences in life. I think that everything happened in 2018 and 2019 to bring us to where we are right now, um, and timing was of the essence. I mean, we, you look at the acquisition cycle. It's, it's a pretty robust, long cycle. It takes you know, anywhere from seven, um, five to seven years to get a program you know, through the RFI process, the RFP process, get the contract award, and, and, and get it to the end. And you have to think, you know, time 2025 is around the corner. Um, we had a, a ticking time bomb on our hands where we needed to get something in place for the industry, for those small businesses most especially, to be prepared for what we see as this, um, you know, this, this confluence of technology along with capability that are, are burgeoning. And um, that would be quantum computing become commercially available capability, um, 2025 timeframe and 5G becoming commercially available in the same time frame. And the uh, analogy that I'm going down here is if you look at a, a home that you live in, you're, you're, you live on you know, blah, 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 Maple Street, and you go home at night and you lock your doors and your windows and you turn on your security alarm. And you do that for security. You buy down the risk of somebody breaking in. And you buy down the risk of the elements um, coming into your environment by you know, building walls and putting doors and windows and a roof. And if you look at encryption as your doors, your locks on your doors and your window, 
and you look at the network, the 4G or LTE network as your house, mm -hmm. in 2025, imagine there are no, if you use basic encryption, quantum computing breaks it. Now yep. it doesn't break, you know, it breaks basic level. So you've lost your doors and your windows. Mm -hmm. And because 4G will be usurped by 5G, there's nothing controlling the element from coming in. Yep. Yeah, we, we are definitely, you know, look, your timing is is ridiculously good because you're right. We're you know, and if you if you blend in stuff, we're not even talking about the newness privacy frameworks and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. We blend in the IoT, the Internet of Bodies, all these things. You know, even blockchain and, and the implications it's going to have. Yeah, the time was right. Um, you guys did, a, I think, personally, a, a great job with the standard. Um, you know, I'm a longtime information security practitioner, and what I like is that you, A, you unified a lot of standards when you did it. Uh, B, I thought you guys did a great job of taking a super found a, scoop, a super sound fundamental approach, right? It's uh, begin with scoping and understanding the, the CUI and the information you need to protect. Then it's understand the risk associated with that information. Yep. And then it's implement the controls in accordance with that risk and in accordance with the government's requirement, DOD's requirement. So, uh, you know, job well done. Thank you. And I, and I will um, give the credit. Um, I was the, uh, the uh, forcing function. Mm -hmm. um, my nickname um, <laughs> was in... Is it, wait, wait, wait. This is a, this is a PG-13 show. Are you sure? Oh, you no, 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 no. Okay, good. <laughs> um, when I was a legislator uh, in South Carolina, the nickname they gave me was Pitbull. And um, I, I really appreciated it because when I see something that needs to be done, I am a Pitbull. I am, I'm going to, um, um, the other one was LD, uh, Little Dynamite, but I loved my Pitbull analogy that, you know, I am fiercely loyal, I am extraordinarily dedicated to the tip mission in front of me. Um, I would be um, remiss if I took onerous for the work that was done to, from and with my team, and uh, it's, I need to give uh, props to the cool. the, the, the workforce that did this. Um, there's a gentleman by the name of Mr. Buddy Dees. Um, Dr. John Choi, Stacy Bosjanic, uh, Ms. Bosjanic, um, they they were really the the forcing function in working with APL, Johns Hopkins, and Carnegie Mellon SEI. Um, the other two people that really need uh, kudos is my boss, Mr. Kevin Fahey, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Acquisition. Um, I, he is one of the most remarkable human beings in the fact that he really loves this country. He really loves the Department of Defense. And he, see, he saw from you know, a vast career, I think he had retired at 34 years um, and then came back to serve, saw where all the pain points were and really was one of those people that could, who said, I will give you top cover, go get it done. And then uh, Ms. Ellen Lord, the Honorable Ellen Lord, who is the Undersecretary of uh, Defense for uh, Acquisition and Sustainment, being a thought leader and saying we needed to get a unified standard. Um, the other um, entity that I need to thank is industry, right? Because I came from industry, I knew very clearly that if I opened the doors to the Pentagon and I said, because anything we develop that the industry has to implement, they have to be in the collaborative process of creating it. So when I said, can you help me, would you, industry, as they as always have done, has supported the, the Department of Defense, rallied around, and we couldn't have done this without the collaboration between industry, academia, and the department and using great solid work that had been led, you know, the charge was led by NIST, the National Institute of Science and Technology. Um, ISO, uh, the International Standards Organization, they had uh, 27001. We had great foundational um, tools we could reference from our, our international 5i partners like the UK, um, Australia. They both had cybersecurity standards. The EU has them. Um, and we took all those great standards and actually put them into a critical thinking methodology about what it was we wanted to do, how to take critical thinking um, to cybersecurity, and creating a maturity model that would take people from absolutely no cyber hygiene all the way up to a level five, um, uh, from one to five, and five being the absolute exquisite. But it, it couldn't have been in the timeline. I mean, it was crazy aggressive when I started this. Um, you know, everybody told me, you're nuts. Um, there's no way you're going to be able to meet that schedule. And, and I've said, you know, um, 
when there's a will and there's a way to get it done, and when we clearly say in the department we need something, I mean, look how fast we did the MRAP. Um, look how fast we did uh, something called Chapter 33, the 9-11 bill, where we needed to be able to produce a, a product that you know those honorable men and women who served um, after 9-11, when they wanted to be able to turn over their GI Bill or their um, benefits to their children um, or their loved ones, we had to create a system to do it. And when we go to industry and we say solve our problems, help us, industry has always answered the call. And this was no different. It was just done in a more aggressive timeline than most. Yeah, and the time, listen, I mean, the, uh, you know, the, the timeline was pretty remarkable. And from my perspective, I mean, the government works in dog years, you know, like seven to one the wrong way. Uh, so if you guys get this done in a year, it was pretty remarkable. But I do think that you had a, a you know, this guy's not a little, little dramatic, but a, a national urgency, right? I mean, you know. Oh, amen. Yeah, you, you had, you, totally. had you, you have huge economic impacts, but you also have, you know, potential loss of life and limb for, for, for our people, correct? Well, absolutely. So you think about what's been going on um, since the Iran issue of a few months ago, right? Mm -hmm. Have you been paying attention to how much ransomware has been going on, right? Yeah, ransomware yeah. attacks. Yeah, oh, yeah. During, so I literally, there's a gentleman who works in the department um, here with me. Um, he is the director of um, Defense Digital Services. His name is Brett Goldstein. Um, he literally starts, and it is refreshing to have people. And because everybody in this building, and I have to say, it's you know, it's amazing the people that come here every day because they love this nation. They want to make a difference. So everybody that works on this in the building and out, we all want to solve the problems. But you have people who come across your path and they, they remind you every day. And, and Brett starts every day off. People are dying out there. Yeah. People yeah. are dying out there. And it really is, it's about the U.S. economy. It's about the global economy. But it's also more importantly, um, young men and women have volunteered to serve this nation to defend our freedoms. They they sign on the dotted line. My my first husband um, did it. He's one of the main reasons that I'm here today. Um, my daughter, uh, my son-in-law, all serve. Mm -hmm. And those young men and women and those people put their lives in our hands, in the industrial base hands, the, to do the right thing, to have the right technology at the right time, so that they can thwart our adversary and know that. And I. I I, I, when I go and speak, I can't help but be who I am. And I love my country. I love democracy. I love what she offers. And I do say she because I'm a girl and I, I, you know, you always do that. Um, he, she, but um, our democracy is something that, you know, countries like China, that, that's not part of how they were culturally. It's a communist country. They do not believe in your freedom. They believe in a different ideology altogether. And their objective, they very really clearly said, we want to be the world's economic dominator. Well, the only problem with that, right, is A, I want to be, but more importantly is we are about the individual freedom, right? We want people to have the right to make a choice. They don't. Right. And we have to see that as, as you know, they – that is, lives are on the line. A global economy is on the line. On us getting this right, the pressure is huge. The timeline, um, you know, the one thing that Secretary Esper has said, and, you know, I really do appreciate his leadership in the, the department, um, is we need to be more okay with taking risk because mm -hmm. this was risky, right? I'm, I went out early on and I, I clearly said these are the dates that we're going to meet. We're going to do this in a collaborative. We're not going to shut the doors of the Pentagon. We're going to bust them wide open. We're going to be completely transparent. We're going to let industry talk to us every chance we can possibly get to craft this the right way. And taking that with a known risk, right? We're not going to be perfect right out of the gate. And if I'm, I, I pray we're not. I, I don't want this to become a checklist. I don't want us to become complacent because this model, the way it lives today, is the threat that we know today. In a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, that threat will change. And if this model, the CMMC, becomes a checklist, we have all failed. Yeah, it needs so, to be critical thinking about cyber. So, so the, you know, it was interesting. Yeah, you did take a big risk 
but I think you had a bigger risk not to take your risk, if that makes sense. Amen. So, yeah, so, I mean, so, so well said. So we did, I think we've done a great job to this point, like, of, I, I think explaining how we got to where we are and why it's so damn important, right? For all of us, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, so thank you. Um, uh, let me bounce into some questions that I think, you know, a lot of people, at least that I'm talking to every day are, are asking, right? Um, yep. so, so from your perspective, when do you think RFPs will actually, and RFIs will actually start referencing CMMC levels? I know you originally said, you know, in June-ish, but has that changed? Because I know that the nope. audit program, okay. So you still expect it to be around that time. Okay, cool. Um, you, you, you know, I understand that uh, uh, the, the uh, couple days before you released uh, version one, which was January 31st, you established mm -hmm. the, uh, the audit program, right? You put a gentleman up, maybe from Darden, uh, in charge of that program? No, no, no. They self-formed. So the accreditation body was self-formed um, by, we asked industry, we said we don't, we, we ah, in the government. I misunderstood that. Oh yeah, no, we did not do that. They, we put out a request for information to give everyone um, that we were going to, with um, Professional Service Council (PSC), mm -hmm. do a a. Um, we did an, an industry day per se, where we came and we said, "This is what we need, um, what we think would be the right thing to do." We would love industry to self-form an accreditation body, a nonprofit, that could take the the model and take it away from the government um, to train and certify the C3PO's, the cyber um, third party um, organ auditing organizations, to train and certify the auditors. Right. And uh, there was a group, um, about 250 people were in person to that meeting. Um, they did a live stream. I, I, there were, were over 1,000 attendees. So for government, that's huge, right? Mm -hmm. um, to come in and say, we need a coalition of the willing. And they self-formed. Um, they stood up. Um, they are doing everything they can possibly do to do the right thing. And the fact that they're a nonprofit that is, um, you know, there's, there's, that needed to happen because we, we really need that. So they stood up um, and we worked the MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding of what the department and the accreditation body would do. Um, and that was the, what we turned, you know, on the 31st, when I was able to turn something over, it was to them only because industry had taken care of the need. Excellent. Excellent. So question for you. So what is the next, like, you know, so, and you may not be able to answer this because like you said, it's an independent body, but I'm sure you have some insight. What, what do you expect the next, you know, three months, six months, whatever it is, like, where, where do you think it will take before, you know, we know what the program looks exactly like, we know how uh, audit audit firms will be accredited, how individual auditors may or may not be accredited, and there'll be uh, entities authorized to conduct audits. Like, wh wh what's the timeline look like right now? So what we gave the accreditation body is the training materials for the certification classes, the curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, we, we told them, you know, we created user guides, we created cur training and curriculum to give to them because ultimately that was, you know, we appreciate them standing it up, but they needed to have a baseline. Mm -hmm. um, they're working with, um, the, the AB works with us. Um, they're working with uh, something called um, DCMA, the DIB CAC, the Defense um, Industrial Base Cyber Audit um, Committee or Council. I can't, but that's what DCMA has been doing to audit uh, companies on cybersecurity um, and DAU to create this training right now so we can get that done. So they're looking to start um, certifying C3 PAOs and individuals who want to become small businesses, individuals who want to become auditors, um, they'll be launching, they have their website up, they'll have a marketplace up in the next few weeks where you can start to register to go to the training classes. Wow. Wow. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, when I so, say so that's it, yeah, you you guys rocked and rolled. I, I didn't, you know, I to be honest with you, I thought it would take longer than. So uh, you know, you mentioned a website. Could do do you offhand know that, or would you be able to send yeah, it to me? Of course, I do. So it's the, sure, it's the cmmcab dot org. Really complicated. <laughs> yeah, I would have never guessed that. <laughs> yeah. um, cmmcab.org. Um, they have a, a website right now. You can actually, if you're interested in becoming an auditor, they actually have a portal you can put your information in. And as soon as the classes are ready to go, which will be starting in late April, 
um, and in May we'll actually have auditors going through the courses um, with the intent as we roll RFIs out in June that we'll have our first round of assessor, uh, certified auditors to be able to go out and start doing assessments. Wow. Um, but so know that um, all of this hinges on a few really important things. First, mm -hmm. we are going through a DFAR rule change. At the start of this podcast, I gave you all the DFAR rule. Mm -hmm. We're going through a rule change. This will cost money. It will impact the U.S. economy. So we're working with OMB and OIRA, who are being phenomenal with us, um, on what the cost is to industry and to the government and to the economy for this to happen. So we're, we're, we're into that process. There will be um, public comment. There will, of, there will be a date in late April, early May, where everybody will be able to come and actually discuss the impact um, the financial impact, and then we'll go to rule change in October 2020. So I picked those dates from the very beginning very um, uh, judiciously because I understood what would need to be done between the rule change. So the reason why I've said you're not going to see it in RFPs until October um, is because the rule change needs to happen before I can put it into RFPs. That makes sense. Um, and, and, and I did... So I did the RFIs, the OTAs, the SIBRs, the STTRs, all of those in that time frame so that we could start working through the pathfinders to get to the RFP process. Like I said, this isn't going to be perfect. We, uh, there will be challenges, but I think that very clearly when we say let's be collaborative to solve this problem, we can solve these problems. We've put a man on the moon. I think we can work through how to get a certification done um, in that time frame and, and make sure it's right. Um, there's a lot of things that are happening in coordination. We've got the Adaptive Acquisition Framework, which is the rewrite of the 5000 series. We have a new um, document coming out on what CUI is, new definitions. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot happening of, of acquisition reform and cybersecurity reform in the department that is changing the way the nation does business. I mean, the DOD is the biggest buyer of many things in this country and in the world. And when we say we need something done, when we say clearly what it is we need, how we need it done, and that we have metrics and, and accountability for it, industry answers. And this CMMC, I don't see any differently. Yeah. Uh, so that's interesting. Um, so, so one of the things you've, uh, so two questions, one quickly, you said that you, um, the budgetary implications, things of that nature, mm -hmm. this ties into this concept of allowable expense, what will or won't be, whether or not there will be allowable expense, whether it's just, is, is that the implication of what you talked about with the, with the dollars? Absolutely. And cents security. Okay. So security is an allowable cost, right? Mm -hmm. If we value it, we pay for it. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky, right? Because industry has been self-attesting that they're doing those NIST 171 <laughs> controls. Yeah, suddenly we need a SIM. Wait a second. The last two years you signed off on the fact you had log management. <laughs> right? This is, this, there is, so what uh, I clearly am working, right? It's, y'all have been saying you're doing it and you're, you're billing us for it. But what I did, um, and it, it's like we, we had all of these things. So we had the, the DCMA, um, um, did have been doing these dib CAC audits on companies. So we've understood what it takes to ramp up to get ready for an assessment. So we had that, right? We, and we've we've gotten the costing. We've been we've done a few of these, so we understood how much it would cost a company to get ready to be assessed. Then because we've done these dib CACs, we understood the time of assessment. And then the third thing is we've been able, because we added 20 controls in CMMC3 to the NIST 171, we were able to price out what those controls look like. So costing, we have a really good understanding of the implication of cost. Gotcha. But let's, let's go back to um, level one, right? So mm -hmm. most Department yeah, of Defense... That's very small. I mean, what, 17 controls? I mean, it's a, it's a pretty low bar, I would say. It is right now because it's simple things like, do you have passwords? Mm -hmm. Do you know how to change? It's, there are no cost things to do except for um, having an antivirus um, software protection. Mm -hmm. So level one is just giving some critical thinking behind why you're doing it. 
doing an audit in person from an assessor saying, okay, you have these. Why doing the physical asset? Why do we have to have an auditor go to your site? A, it buys down the risk of shell companies being stood up. That if you're going to be a shell company, you're going to have to go through an awful lot of pain to get ready to have an, an auditor, a trusted agent from the government coming to your facility. So it's buying down risk on shell companies. It's buying down risk on FOIA, um, FOICA, the, um, the foreign investment, right? Mm -hmm. And it's buying down the risk of CFIUS. So we, we had a reason why we set it up this way. So very clearly one of the core essential missions of the CMMC was it needed to be low cost enough that a small business could, it could be ingested. So mm -hmm. if CMMC level one costs a company more than you know, a, a $3,000, we've mm -hmm. missed the mark. Gotcha. It needed to be somewhat automated, to which it is, but it needed to do multifaceted. It can break down a lot of, of barriers that we have, CFIUS, um, uh, uh, foreign ownership, FOICA, uh, FOIA. I, I always get FOIC. I say it wrong, so forgive me, everybody, but foreign ownership in corporations. Um, we needed it simply. Now, when you go to CMMC3, that's when you're instituting the current NIST 171, which you should be doing already if you have that DFAR clause in your contract. And I'm clearly paving the way to make sure that we get security as an allowable cost, the cost of the certification, the cost of the additional controls. We have cost realism so that we ensure that you're able and you have the financial resources to do what we need you to do. So we've really done a lot of homework on this. Um, and learning from things that we've done in the past, um, but also understanding that this needed, at the end of the day, this was going to be something that was an allowable cost, which means ultimately taxpayers and programs needed to be set up. So we've been working for a, a, a good year on this, um, mm -hmm. and and we think we're on really solid ground. It sounds. Listen, it, it sounds to me like it's a worthwhile investment, right? If we're talking, you know, five or ten or fifteen or twenty thousand dollars to do an audit, but we're saving six hundred billion. You can do a lot of audits Amen. for six hundred billion dollars a year, right? So I mean, if, the, if the, I the ROI just, should be huge. Let, just dollars and cents, be. let alone like national defense and life and limb and 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 economics and everything else. So, uh, sounds, we can't afford not cool. to do it. Yeah, I, I would we agree. We can't completely. afford not to do it. Um, so question for you, do you, do you yet know, and I don't know if this is your decision, if it's the accreditation body's decision, uh, is the thought process that you'll have to recertify each year or every other year? Will there be? No, some that, type that was, um, that was the MOU. It's going to be every three years for every companies. Years, okay. Yep. I, I missed that. Sorry about that. Oh, no, no, no. It's listen, there are a lot of details about this. And if it wasn't me, you know, if I wasn't so, you know, 15 hours a day in it, I wouldn't know it either. Um, we were looking for a certification for a company to be once every three years. Um, we want the certification to be good for the whole of the Department of Defense. So if you're bidding on work for the Army, you're bidding on work for the Air Force, the Marine Corps, the Navy, it's the same certification. So we're buying down the cost um, on that because right now companies, you know, if right now the cyber requirements for the Navy aren't the same as, as the Air Force and companies are having to, you know, invest to meet those, it's level setting. Um, the second thing that it does for small businesses, people have said, you know, this is an unfair burden for small business. It actually level sets. And here's why. Currently, the self-attestation says that you're technically acceptable. Okay? If you tell the test that you're doing the 110 controls, you are technically acceptable. If you're bidding on work and somebody, a competitor, is only implementing, let's say, 80 of these controls, and they have a plan to get better on the rest. It's in their POAM, their plan of action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Their rate is going to be lower than that of a company who is actually doing all 110. They don't have a POAM, but both would be technically acceptable in the current standing of way the DFAR rule is today. That's, that is unfair because mm -hmm. the, the lowest price technically acceptable wins and you, we had to level set, so it actually helps small business. Then the small businesses have come back and they said, well, we're a mom and pop shop. We're a single supplier. It's not worth it to do it. You know, we, we, we don't do that much with the Department of Defense. We don't see the value. You're the exact reason why I need this done. Our adversaries know that who you are. 
They know who that small business yep. is, and more than likely they're working to, to put you out of business. You're the ones I need this the most for. So we've worked through multiple small build business programs like the P-Tax, the Professional Technical um, um, Assistance um, Centers for Cyber, um, to get them up to speed on CMMC. Um, things like Dreamport here are running, you know, they have Project Spectrum, which is a launching pad for cybersecurity education for small businesses. We absolutely need those that are the weakest link in the supply chain to get secure because my supply chain is essential to national defense. Everyone in it is essential. And you're only as good as your weakest link. If I don't shore up that small business and give them critical thinking skills about cyber, if I don't tell them I'm willing to pay for you to do that, then they're always going to be a vulnerability. And mm -hmm. you know, we're all in this together, so I've got to get everybody right. Right, and I'm always telling clients now, you know, like small companies, you know, that you'll be on the phone. They're like, "Well, we don't need Fort Knox security," and you're like, "Wait a second, it no longer matters how big a company you are." It matters how big the companies you work for and the value of their of their information that you're processing. So, you know, unfortunately, these little guys have to understand, you know, this data is is needs to be treated properly, and we have to ensure that it does. And and you're not alone in in, in the DoD. I mean, we're seeing this, you know, across the banking industry and every other industry as well. So, oh, absolutely. I think you're, I think you're a good company with what you're doing. The, the, the fact is, you know, I, I've, I, when I first started the speaking tour, and it's become part of my, you know, I say you have to say things three times for people to remember, but when I go out, um, and because I was a politician at one time, you, you learn how to communicate. Um, it's, there's this thing, right? Um, I, I went out and I spoke and I asked, uh, it, it was at a university, and I said, tell me something in your life that doesn't have cyber. Tell me. And this kid looks at me and he's like, an apple. And I'm like, well, unless the apple magically appeared, it got there through cyber. It came through a logistics plan. When you bought it at the grocery store, you paid for it. There was a UPC barcode. There's financing. There's a whole bunch of cyber behind that apple. And then one kid said to me, you know, oh, well, love. And I said, well, I met my current husband on eHarmony. So, uh, yeah, that's out, right? The algorithm works. We have to understand that... In our environment today, cyber is in everything we do. And this is an analogy everybody can, can gather around. We as human beings have been able to understand and how to absorb technology and capability and assuming risk since the dawn of time. When the caveman first found fire, they needed to figure how to use that capability, that technology, harness it, and understand the risk associated with it. They touched fire, it burned. If you put it near wood, it burned. We had to learn what the, the critical thinking on how to use fire to our benefit and, and buying down the risk. We have to do the same with cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. We Absolutely. have to learn how to harness the risk. And the CMMC is the start. I don't think it's nearly done. I think it's a piece of a larger puzzle. I think continuous monitoring needs to become a common thing. We need to have supply chain illumination um, so that we can see a supply chain. We can do continuous monitoring. We need to harness that and, and get you know AI and machine learning to do indicators and warning um, so we can thwart threat, not be reactive to threat. That's, you know, we got to get proactive. But the CMMC is the start of a new way of, of doing business. We need to make sure that security and how we communicate threat to each other is as equal to how we communicate safety, right? You, you know clearly when you go to a shop, um, and I'll use, you know, a manufacturing floor, they know how to clearly convey risk and safety by telling people you can't walk on the shop floor unless you've got hard toe shoes, steel toed shoes, you've got to wear pants, you must tuck them in, you must wear long sleeve shirts, a helmet and goggles because safety is something that we all understand. There's a common language, there's expectations, a common standard, the ISO 9000. We know how to communicate it. We have to do the same about cybersecurity. And Amen. the CMMC is that first start.
So quick question for you. So um, I, it, recently you discussed, a, I'll call it a staged approach where you, you, you throw out some numbers like 1,500 entities certified yep. in mm-hmm. year one, 7,500, 25,000. Um, uh, what's that? What's the reasoning? So two questions for you. One, why that specific number? Is it just a timing issue of, you know, that October 20th to the end of the year? Uh, yeah, so that's one question. The second question is, will those 1,500 be a specific 1,500 based on some criteria, or is those the first 1,500 that are able to get through the process and, and they're itself self, uh, self-requesting, if you will? So we clearly understood the acquisition process. So I knew that, A, any, com- any contract that you currently have with the Department of Defense today is, does not have the CMMC. So mm-hmm. I knew I wasn't going to walk in and turn on a light switch and suddenly everybody had to be certified. We had to have it rolled out with the amount of accreditors, you know, the assessors, so we could scale it, right? It had to be scalable. And anything that we did, we understood clearly that we needed to start with a few pathfinders to work the bugs out. So why we picked a few RFIs where they were around critical technologies, they were around what we needed to protect the most in our industrial base and for the nation, and working with those communities of interest to ensure that those few contracts that we start with RFIs, that we're really working hand-in-hand with industry, with the accreditation body, to ensure that the communities of interest get their certifications underway before we release the RFP. Gotcha. 1,500 was, if we were to take how many contract actions a year I had based it on, you know, statistics, how many contracts get let, um, how many of them had the, you know, the critical technology. So it was all um, statistics that we had based and baked in. Um, It was 1,500 um, this year, 75 new. So you figure that 7,500 plus 1,500 Mm -hmm. would have 9,000 new contractors in year 2021 and we would you know move through so we could scale up to the amount of companies that we have in the dib over that five-year um, transition timeline as we went through new acquisition cycle so it was a very um, well thought out process mm-hmm. we also needed to ensure that the programs that would be rolling it out had the budget to do it um, and ensuring that we had consistency throughout that whole process. So that's why we did the rollout the way we did. Gotcha. Ten contracts in 2020 that had 150 um, independent contractors, vendor partners on them that we could walk through clearly with industry. That was the number. 150 gotcha. um, companies per contract. That's you know times 10. That's 1,500. That's pretty cool. So quick question for you. So, you know, I, I've had this conversation with a bunch of people and they're saying, even if we're not bidding on one of those RFIs, we might want to get CMMC level three certified because we think that it'll be advantageous in the marketplace, it for is. example, joining pursuit teams. So will there be anything that would prevent, like, I know this might be tricky with allowable expense. Maybe it's not allowable expense yet, but either way, like if I'm, if I'm a firm that wants to get ahead of the curve, will I be able to go out and get certified? Absolutely. You know, in, okay, good. And that Absolutely. seems to be and we a, want a common to, thought process. So because I, I actually sit on something called the Federal Acquisition Security Council. Mm-hmm. Um, this was stood up. Um, there was a law passed in 2018. It's called the Secure Technologies Act. And what it did is it created this Federal Acquisition Security Council that we have to create unified standards and processes to secure the federal government. So I've already leaned in, you know, Chris Krebs over at uh, CISA for um, DHS. Um, I've talked to many other federal agencies. This framework is something that they're all looking to adopt uh, and you know, support. It's so funny. I, it's so funny. I, 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 I have that on my list of questions, and I was like, "Man, should I surprise her with this?" Um, no. Because you know, because the, the you know, there's there's the word leaking around, and in fact, it was funny. Uh, an e-discovery company today, a client of ours, I was looking at a contract, and the con- I won't say what a federal agency it was from, but I've never seen a federal agency use NIST SP 8171 in the way they did, and they actually referred to a 3PAO doing the audit. And it, to me, I was looking at this going, yeah, this is going to be a CMMC audit in a few years from them. It, Absolutely. Is, is, so that's 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 a uh, that, that's that's legit, and they're, they're, you you guys have actually talked to other agencies about potential. Oh my gosh, yes. It's, okay. I literally had talked to as many agencies 
um, you know, the, and I, it, it's just, it only makes sense. It makes right? so much sense, not only from the government's perspective, but from my customer's perspective, because, you know, now you've got this, it, think about it, if you had a sort of a national certification, you know, that, that, okay, you can work with any government entity that processes data of a certain classification level using the same validation mechanism. I mean, that's win-win oh, win for everybody, right? So let me give an easy way for your listeners to um, understand this, right? Mm -hmm. So back when we created, uh, the first automobiles came out, right? There were no rules. There was, you did not understand. There were, there were no roads. There were no rules. You could drive wherever you wanted to, right? As we realized that because there were going, to, we were going to be, we would have to use the same modes of, of roads to get to where we had to get to, there had to be a common understanding of risk and that I understood that you were qualified with the same understanding as I was to drive on the road. Mm -hmm. Hence, we created roads and the risk grew because you could drive into me. I mean, the automobile could kill. It, that's the reality. We created a way that we could all get a, a trust and buy down the risk, a common understanding called driver's licenses. Right? You had to go get a license to drive. Mm -hmm. You had to pass a test that you understood the critical thinking around driving a car. What happened then? Then we had to, you start driving around. What was the next thing that came out? We needed a way that, that I could assure that you understood the risk and you were obeying the law. Something called insurance came out. So we all have to have a driver's license. We all have to be trust but verify we know how to drive. How do we verify? Is that we have insurance rates based on how well we follow the rules. Yeah, you take your driver's license in the United States of America. You go to any country in the world and they'll give you what? They'll let you rent a car. Why? Because they know we understand how to assess the risk, to test against it, and validate it. At the mm -hmm. end of the day, the CMMC is your cyber driver's license. Well, you, you just piqued my interest a little bit. So you might be familiar you know, with in, in the privacy space, right? We have this concept, the U.S. has a program called Privacy Shield. And it's supposed mm -hmm. to provide some level of assurance that we're doing the right things from a personal information perspective. So any EU nation might look at that and say, yeah, okay, we can ship our data there. That's kind of an interesting idea that once we get to that point, if we're ahead of the game relative to most other countries, that's going to make American companies that you're sharing data with uh, perhaps have an advantage over other company, uh, uh, companies from other countries that don't have that same level of assurance. So, so that's kind of a cool idea. The, the UK, the EU, mm -hmm. Australia, Canada all have cyber standards. Mm -hmm. They already yeah, have done them. Are, yeah, and, 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 and correct me if I'm wrong, but most of those you've actually baked into CMMC, yep. right? That, that, that's the, uh, the cyber essentials, I think they're referred to, right? Yep. In Australia they're cyber, and uh, UK, I think both call them cyber yeah, essentials. Yeah, they call them cyber essentials. Canada is a volunteer program that they set up a few years ago, but they're moving towards adopting. So most of these countries, our 5 I partners have already leaned in. I mean, I um, met with Canada again today. I, I've been to Canada. Um, I talk to the Ministry of Defense at the UK pretty regularly, um, how we're going to do reciprocity. Um, oh, because cool. this. Yeah, it's, it's really taken a, a global. And, you know, you go back and you think, how did we come to where we are today? So I always say there's nothing new under the sun, right? It's just a new way of looking at it. So you think about after World War II, um, the government, the Department of Defense had something called a mil spec. And the mil spec is how the Department of Defense clearly defined how they needed quality and safety standards to be imparted into the manufacturing of product, right? At the same time, we started doing more global and international partners. We were building tanks together. Um, so we had the NATO partners stood up something called the NATO standard. We had a very clear language, each of us, on how we, we thought we can convey quality and safety. Well, when we realized that we needed a common language, that's how ISO was started. The International Standards Organization was started because the DOD let in with the mil spec. NATO responded and created an international standards. We're mm -hmm. doing the exact same thing with the CMMC. Yeah, we are so the funny. world's largest buyer. We're determining how to do the buy. Therefore, everybody will jump on board. And it's funny. It's you know, it's us and and you know, BS seven seven nine nine. British the British Security Standard was the basis of ISO one seven seven nine seven seven nine nine, which is like the root of ISO twenty seven thousand one and two. Uh, yep. So so we're, we're we're it's a it's a big circle, right? Um, yep. So this was awesome. 
uh, is there, you know, you, you did a great job of getting all of the questions that I had a- answered in a way which was fantastic. Uh, anything, uh, anything else that you want to bring up? Yeah, first I want to remind everybody that in electronic warfare, and that's what we're in, um, what the threat looks like today, it will be different, and we needed the capability to, to be agile to that. So the CMMC shouldn't become a checklist. It should, become, it, it should be a tool that we can constantly tweak as the threats change. We need to change our thinking around them. Mm-hmm. So know that it's, you know, you're never going to be 100% secure. Anybody that sells you that is selling you a false bill of goods. But the best thing that the CMMC can do, and we can do as a nation, right? We excel as a country, as, as you know, this amazing democracy, when we can buy down the risk and buy up the uncertainty and widen the delta between the two. That's when Americans do the most good. That's when the human spirit and everything that we stand for in this country really excel. The CMMC is everything we can do to widen that, that delta. Let's give ourselves the opportunity to excel by buying down risk and buying up the uncertainty, making it harder for our adversaries to exfil our systems, making it harder for them to break into our critical infrastructure, to weaken our country. Do these things. Do them not because the government says it's what they want. Really look at it as, why wouldn't I do this for my own family? Why wouldn't I put this kind of security around how I access the Internet, how it is able to affect me? So, yes, the CMMC is about your business, but it's also that level one, CMMC level one, those core fundamental cyber hygiene practices are what you should be doing every single day because there are people, it's not just China, North Korea, Iran, Russia, it's, you know, those um, it's cyber criminals that are looking to steal your identity. They're looking to steal your money. These are simple things that we need to do to really function as a society in this environment that we live in. We're not going backwards. We're only going to greater things. Let's get the simples down. Um, I, I liken this to General Honore will always go down as one of the, the key things and you know, Occam's razor is the simplest solution. General Honore said it after Hurricane Katrina, keep it simple, keep it simple. So, and if you do the, the, the simple things every day, when hard, big challenges come, we're in a much better place to deal with them. Yeah, you know, as as you were speaking there, I couldn't help but think of Jerry, I think it was Jerry Maguire with, you know, help me help you. Yep. Um, you know, I mean, in a real, I mean, literally that's, I mean, look, this is win, 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 right? It, it's good for the companies. It's, it's good for the government. It's good for our country. So uh, I'm, I'm on board. Um, yep. so, so, uh, I got one last question for you. So, so when this audit program gets a little further established and we kind of have a better sense in the allowable expense, and all that stuff, m- might I, in- might I ask you to come back if there's something interesting to talk Absolutely. about? Absolutely. So listen, um, I, I do as many public engagements. I try really, because I, I said at the beginning of the podcast, I work for the U.S. taxpayer. I am doing this on behalf of the U.S. taxpayer. So anytime that I can help communicate, I am all in. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation. Um, I appreciate the opportunity. The Department of Defense appreciates the opportunity. And I can speak for, you know, the, the hundreds of thousands of people that work inside the building and, and outside the building is it's an honor and a privilege to work for the best country that has ever been on, on the surface of this globe. And it we do it all with pride every day. And the last thing is that um, – to all of those people who work on both sides, you know, contractors and people that work in the government, um, you know, direct for. Thank you. Thank you for what you do every day. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for your dedication because look at where we are as a nation. Um, The events of 9-11 were horrific, but think about how our country has managed to thwart cyber threat and stay functioning and stay open every single day. It's only because of great people like you on the phone and those people listening to this podcast doing the right things for the right country at the right time at the right place. So thank you.
Sounds great. Uh, so so I, this is called the tease. I'm going to tease, hopefully, your next appearance. And I'm going to say that you're going to pr promise to, what, what, did, what was the term you used? Animal spirit? <laughs> when, when, My when animal I, spirit. Yeah, no, don't, don't say, you're not. Shh, 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 shh. Everybody so has their spirit I animal. I have you, mine. I know, but we're, and, and we're going to tell them about it in the next podcast. All right, so before That's I think awesome. about <laughs> um, they probably wonder, where, where the heck did that come from? Uh, you know, but, but I'll remind them that I screwed up the original recording, and you were gracious enough to, to, to let me restart it. So real quick for no. you, uh, 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 before we say farewell, uh, any, if somebody wanted to get, you know, what's the right way if somebody has a question about CMMC? How would they so get that? They, Who would they reach out to at your, at your org there? So um, go to the website, the CMMC website, that, uh, that, and all you have to do, make it simple, Google DOD CMMC, and you'll see the, um, the OSD website for it. There's a portal there that you can ask questions. Um, more than happy to go there. Go to the AB. Um, that's an easy way to, to ingest. We get about 300 questions a day. Um, we have a team answering them. We're doing our absolute best. Um, go to the website for FAQs, Frequently Asked Questions. We update those pretty frequently. Um, and so does the accreditation body. And for those people that have um, a, a they really, really need me either A, to come talk to their leadership. They, they need help with that. Or um, they, they have a very specific question. I ask you to um, use this judiciously because I am one individual, but I will give your listeners my email address mm -hmm. at the um, DOD. And that's K-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E dot E dot Arrington, that's A-R-R-I-N-G-T-O-N dot Civ, C-I-V, at mail, M-A-I-L dot mail. And we'll throw, that that they, the, we'll throw that in the podcast yes. notes. That way in case somebody had trouble keeping up with that, they'll have it. Yeah, because I, I, I do, I am a quick talker. Um, I ask you, you know, don't, don't use that for a sales pitch. That goes to the AB. If you have a product, we need to get you over to the accreditation body to get you into the, the network for that because we do see cybersecurity as a service product. Mm -hmm. um, how people will meet the needs of the CMMC, especially small businesses. Um, but if you have a question um, and you need help or you need, um, you've listened to this and you think your corporation would be beneficial, your leadership needs to hear it, I work for the U.S. taxpayer. I work for you. Reach out to me. I do my best to return those emails. Um, how we got on this podcast today is me returning emails. So I, I do do my very best. Um, but try not to do, um, and it's not that I'm, I, I love salespeople and BD, but there's not a lot. I've, I've got to focus in on getting this done. So let me just help with the questions, the products. I'll, I'll generate you to the accreditation body and make sure we get you over there. Okay, so Katie, it's 522 on a holiday weekend on a Friday. You're still on the phone with me, sitting alone in the Pentagon. So I just painted I a nice picture. Get home. Have a good time. Thank you so much for, for, for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you for the opportunity. And everybody out there, um, take care. God bless you all. And uh, thank God we live in the greatest country in the world. God bless the USA.